Well, good afternoon, everybody. I'm John Hughes. I'm the president of the National Press Club, and I'm an editor for Bloomberg First Word, the breaking news desk here in Washington for Bloomberg. Before we get started, I just wanted to recognize a few people in the audience at the start. We have our chairman of the Board of Governors for the National Press Club, Ken Melgren, is here. Ken, could you stand? And... And our vice president of the National Press Club, Tommy Burr, I saw you a minute ago. Where are you, Tommy? There you are, okay. Tommy, welcome. And Delphine Halgan, the U.S. Director for Reporters Without Borders is here and has been so helpful. Delphine, where are you? There you are, okay, thank you. And our own Bill McCarran, Executive Director of the Press Club, he's back there working. Raise your hand, Bill been so helpful in pulling all this together. Thank you, Bill. So we're here to talk about the case of Washington Post reporter Jason Rezaian. Jason has been held in an Iranian prison since July 22nd. Imagine July 22nd. This is the longest captivity for a Western journalist in Iran. It's just been too long. I'm joined up here by Ali Rezaian, Jason's brother who's seated two, two people over from me, and Doug Gell, who's Jason's editor at the Washington Post. Now, we at the National Press Club, uh, let's applaud them, yes. We at the National Press Club speak out year-round on press freedom through our programs and through our statements. We represent 3,100 members worldwide. Today, we're taking the additional step of holding a news conference. Why are we doing that? Well, first, unfortunately, more journalists around the world are being prevented from doing their jobs. We at the club are raising our voices to fight this trend because it's happening more and it's unfortunate. Second, with Jason, this is personal. Washington is our home. It's the home of the National Press Club. Jason's newspaper lands on our front porches. It's read online as we sit at our breakfast table drinking coffee. Jason is part of our Washington journalism community. Quite simply, Jason is like family to us. So today, we're making a special announcement. It is my great honor to announce that the club's Press Freedom Committee and the club's Board of Governors has voted to give Jason one of our greatest recognitions, the John Abishan Press Freedom Award. Now this is a high distinction from the club for journalists who face adversity in the performance of their craft and who show a commitment to press freedom. We'll recognize the winner of this award and all our award winners in a prestigious dinner we hold each year in our ballroom. This year it's on July 29th. Mark your calendars, it's one of the best nights of the year at the National Press Club. Now we expect Jason will be free to collect this award. Repeat, we expect Jason will be free to collect this award. In the past, we have seen nations large and small decide that they do not want us to go to the microphone at these award dinners and say, this winner cannot be with us tonight because he or she continues to be held in prison. It is in Iran's power to prevent this from happening. Iran can set Jason free. We hope and believe the leaders will do the right thing. It is time, it is past time, for Jason to be released. We at the National Press Club, with our 3,100 members worldwide and all of the facilities and technology at our disposal, will continue raising our voices. We'll do it again and again and again. We'll do it until Jason is free. Thank you. I now invite Jason's editor, Doug Gell of the Washington Post, to come to the podium for some remarks. Thank you all for being here. 
you know, last year was among the most dangerous years ever recorded for journalists working abroad. Reporters and photographers working in zones of war and deadly disease making calculable sacrifices for readers around the world, including readers of the Washington Post. At the Post, we feel particular outrage at the severe treatment endured by Jason Rezaian, our cherished Tehran correspondent, who's now been detained in Iran for 233 days. At every turn, Iran's handling of the case has reinforced an impression of state-sponsored injustice. Jason is a fully accredited journalist who has done nothing wrong. He has been held since July 22nd without access to a lawyer, without visits by consular authorities, without a public accounting of charges against him. He has been subjected to extensive interrogation, which has taken a significant toll. We know that fairness and justice could only result in Jason's immediate release. The approaching Iranian New Year, Nowruz, should be a season of mercy, and we call on Iran to act on this spirit. Until Jason is free, his treatment by Iran can only be seen as an abomination worthy of the world's condemnation. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. We're joined today by people from change.org, and you might see these boxes over here. Can the folks from Change come on up uh, and, and be recognized? And they're bringing up an additional box. So these are petitions calling for Jason's release. And literally, they've been going up by thousands, really, by day and by week. And we're now up to around 235, 239,000. And it certainly has gone up a lot today, in fact just since these gentlemen started doing satellite TV interviews at 6.30 a.m. They've had a long day already. And so if you can maybe hold up one of those uh, for me, but what you'll see is simply page after page after page printed out of signature after signature in all 239,000 people from the United States and in the world growing by hundreds and thousands almost daily. And we hope it grows more today. Everybody who can hear my voice on web, on TV, please go to change.org and add your name, because we believe this will make a difference. We wouldn't be doing this if we didn't think this would make a difference. So please, take a minute to sign that petition. Thank you very much. And earlier today, the National Press Club was proud to release a statement from the greatest, Muhammad Ali, about Jason's case. We can't tell you how excited and honored we were to do this, and that Muhammad Ali was willing to speak out on Jason's case tells you what kind of champ he truly is. We want to state publicly how grateful we are to Mr. Muhammad Ali that he took the time to do this. And I'm, in a minute, going to invite Jason's brother, Ali, to the podium. And Jason will, or Ali will read a statement about Jason. But before he does that, he's also going to read uh, the statement from Muhammad Ali. Ali. So this is a statement that was released from Muhammad Ali yesterday. With the name of Allah, the beneficent and merciful, I am sorry that I cannot physically, I cannot be physically present to lend my support in person, but I pray my words will provide relief to the efforts to secure the release of Jason Rezaian. Inshallah, it is my great hope that the government and judiciary of Iran will end the prolonged detention of journalist Jason Rezaian and provide him with access to all of his legal options. During his time as the Washington Post bureau chief in Tehran, Jason used his gift of writing and intimate knowledge of the country to share the stories of the people and culture of Iran to the world. To my knowledge, 
Jason is a man of peace and great faith, a man whose dedication and respect for the Iranian people is evident in his work. I support his family, friends, and colleagues in their efforts to obtain his release. Muhammad Ali. I was thinking about writing something to say about that, but uh, this morning I received an email from my mother, uh, and uh, I'm just going to read you what she said uh, when she got to see it, not realizing it was coming. I'm speechless and profoundly grateful. For decades, for decades, Muhammad Ali has been the most esteemed American throughout the Islamic world. To receive his generous support is truly a blessing for Jason and our family. That's my mom. So, now it's my turn. Thank you all for joining us today. First, I'd like to thank the National Press Club for making the event possible, and also for acknowledging Jason with their award for press freedom this year. Thank you very much. I'm very sorry it's necessary for Jason or any other journalist, but I think this year it, it means extra so much in the world. I'd also like to thank Reporters Without Borders and Change.org for their tireless efforts on Jason's behalf. Finally, I'd like to acknowledge the extraordinary efforts, both public and private, of the Washington Post and our family's advisors, who've been working towards Jason and Yegi's release for these past 233 days. Before we take questions, I want to update you on Jason and Yegi's situation and give you a sense of our ongoing efforts to raise international awareness of the Islamic Republic of Iran's unprecedented detention of a credentialed journalist. I'll also address expected future milestones in the case. As of today, my brother Jason has been held in Iran's Evin prison for nearly eight months. This is twice as long as any other Western journalist has ever been held in Iran. Throughout his ordeal, Jason has been subjected to intense interrogation, isolation, and has been denied timely medical treatment. The Iranian government has never provided evidence of any wrongdoing on his part, and they have systematically ignored their own legal process to extend his detention deprive Jason of his rights to legal counsel and deny virtually all his protections under the Iranian Constitution. As you can imagine, Jason's imprisonment has been tremendously difficult on him. For nearly five months, Jason was held in solitary confinement, frequently interrogated for seven to 10 hours per day, and then subjected to weeks long periods of isolation. Within the first two months of his detention, Jason lost nearly 50 pounds. He suffered through months of debilitating back pain and serious infections, exacerbated by delays in treatment. I am happy to report that in the recent months, Jason has been treated by appropriate physicians and has been moved from solitary into a shared cell. But while we, while we are told that his physical condition has improved, we know that these past eight months have taken a great toll on his psychological condition. Any person subjected to these conditions would be psychologically scarred. But in Jason's case, there's the added burden of knowing that without even the pretense of evidence, the country which he worked so hard to demystify to the world continues to deprive him of his rights and ignores their legal process to prevent him from presenting a defense. While Jason's wife, Yegane, was released on bail nearly two months after she was taken and two months in Evin, 
she continues to suffer. For months, she was forbidden to consult an attorney. Her press credentials have been revoked, and she lives in constant fear of punishment for any misstep in her daily life. All this while she works desperately within Iran to free Jason and is unable to interact with many of her friends. In early January, the case was referred to the Revolutionary Court and assigned to a judge known for imposing harsh sentences and limiting defendants' ability to prepare and present a defense. Since the case entered the judiciary, Yegane and Jason have, after nearly six months, been able to hire an attorney. Though pressure and illegal tactics were employed to prevent Jason from retaining separate counsel. I'm happy to report that Jason and Yegane's attorney has begun the review of their case file. Separately, the judge recently approved her request for more frequent visitation, and Jason and, Jason and Yegane will be allowed to resume face-to-face -face meetings after nearly two months. We have been fortunate enough to have a tremendous support system, which I mentioned earlier, and I want to highlight some of our current efforts. First, I would like to call your attention to the letter released today and joined by many notable journalists and international organizations, calling on the leaders of Iran's judiciary to revisit this case. We are confident that any fair reading of the evidence will result in Jason and Diagonese's immediate release. Today, we are also making available two videos for your use. The first video is produced by the Washington Post and focuses on the facts of Jason and Yegi's ordeal. The second video, produced by Jason's friend of 35 years, Robbie Stotter, focuses on our mother's trip to Iran in December, her meetings with Jason, and her feelings on the situation. We're thrilled by the overwhelming response to the petition on change.org, which is at change.org slash free Jason. As an individual, you can join nearly 250,000 people who have signed the petition. It is notable that this petition has remained one of the fastest growing petitions on change.org for the past month, with people from over 80 countries calling for Jason's immediate release. As always, information about the case, links to relevant articles and updates can be found on the website www.freejasonandyegi.com. You can use hashtag FreeJason or at FreeJasonYegi on Twitter. And on Facebook, you can go to FreeJasonYegi. So thinking ahead and the next month or so, When my mother returned from Iran in January, she told me that Jason said, tell Ali to get me out before my birthday. At the time, that seemed like a reasonable timeline, albeit one that I don't have control over. Jason's birthday is this coming Sunday. In addition, Iranians around the world next week will be celebrating New, or New Year's, Nowruz, at the spring solstice. This year it falls on March 20th. This is a very significant time of the year for Iranians, a time of new beginnings when families gather and a time of generosity and mercy. Jason Inyegi's lawyer has requested a temporary bail for Jason for the first five days of the new year. In the spirit of Nowruz, I would ask all those in power in Iran, consider if they truly believe that Jason should begin the new year in Avin. And I would ask that Judge Salavati please allow Jason to spend the Nowruz with his wife and her family. Those are my prepared remarks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ali. And before we take questions, I wanted to see, there were some people from Marin. Uh, okay, they are here. Okay, could you stand up? 
All right, so these are former classmates of Jason's from Marin uh, Academy, and uh, they're led by Rachel Goes. Rachel, that you're okay, Rachel. And uh, they've known Jason for many years, as I understand, and a journalism teacher who worked with Jason is here uh, when Jason was in his formative journalism years. And uh, obviously they're here to show their support for Jason and he's that kind of person, and I think it tells you, I think you're getting the, the feeling for what kind of person he is, what kind of journalist he is, and the strong connections that he has that people come out and show their support to get him free. So thank you for being here. All right, All right now does anybody have questions? And if you do, I think we have microphones floating around out there. Uh, so. If you'd like to ask a question, okay, go ahead. Uh, and hold on a second. Let's let's let that microphone. Uh, for any of you, I was wondering if you think the impending culmination of talks, the Iran nuclear talks, what will that mean for Jason uh, and his detention? Well, I think we know that uh, there's always been two tracks there, and, there, and there's a uh, conversation going on between the governments uh, that are separate. I don't know that uh, there's a definitive culmination of those uh, talk of the other talks that are, are uh, has been planned. But uh, our feeling is that this is a separate case. Jason has nothing to do with the Iranian government. He has no connections with the American government. He was working as a journalist and has been held with no evidence with for no purpose for eight months. There should be no linkage between them. That's what the Iranian government has said. That's what uh, our government has said. Uh, and I think I would hold them to their word on that. If I can, can just add, Secretary Kerry has said repeatedly that he brings up the case of Jason and other detained Americans at every opportunity when he meets with uh, officials of Iran. We hope and expect that will happen again next week when he's due to meet with uh, his Iranian counterparts in Switzerland for five days. And we do see this as a time when the world's attention will again be on Iran, and a time when Iranian representatives can show their commitment to following the rules, uh, to making good on their commitment to make Iran a country of laws and give Jason the uh, fair and just re treatment he deserves. Anybody else? Okay, go ahead. Uh, just to be clear, uh, has Jason met with uh, with a lawyer at this time? Have they met in person? To my knowledge right now, at this moment, Jason has not been able to meet with the lawyer uh, since she was engaged as his attorney. I believe that at one point they were introduced. Uh, I don't know if they were able to talk, but uh, he has not been able to consult with her uh, on the case. And, and no charges have been filed at this point, no, disclosed against him? There have never been any charges disclosed by the Iranian government, uh, and uh, we don't really know what they, what they are. There have been changes, my understanding is, is as, as the case has proceeded, um, but uh, un until they move it to court, I don't know that we will know that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think actually one thing I would like to add on that is that, uh, you know, by law in Iran, uh, any defendant uh, has the right to meet with their attorney. Uh, this is something that not only engagement of the attorney has been, has been delayed for over seven months, uh, but he should be allowed to meet with his attorney after she has the ability, after she has access to the case file so that they can discuss in depth his defense and how to respond uh, to the allegations. And, and, and if I could add on, on that subject, uh, lawyers who Jason and Yegi originally tried to uh, engage um, uh, were told that uh, they would not be accepted as, as Jason's counsel. We're very glad that he now is working with with an attorney, the same attorney that his wife is, is working with, but um, earlier choices that should have been Jason's to make were denied by the courts. Uh, go ahead. I don't have any information about a trial date at this point. Anybody else? Go ahead. Um, 
you said earlier, Ali, that, um, that the lawyer had access to the case file at this point and is reviewing the case file. That's correct. What's your sense of what the, what the inf what, what's your sense of what is contained in that case file? What is the, um, you know, what, what is the, what is the information evidence um, mm -hmm. um, that 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 um, is is in the file that is um, you know um, that is that is uh, that is against uh, Jason and and Yegi? Well, I think I'll first start by saying that uh, because the case is in the Revolutionary Court, uh, the attorney is forbidden from discussing the contents of. The, uh, of the charges and the, and, and the evidence that they have. But what I can do, and, and so I don't have any information about that specifically, but what I can do is tell you a little bit about what we know that Jason has been interrogated about while he was being interrogated over four months, uh, and uh, that might give you an idea of what's in there. So let's start with the case file itself is a set of papers and documents. It is approximately 10 three-inch binders full of paper, some of it handwritten, some of it recordings, transcripts, those types of things. Uh, my understanding is that they spent a significant amount of time talking about emails. They spent a significant amount of time uh, talking about uh, the individuals who visited Jason and Yegane's house uh, for dinner and the like. They had... Uh, records going back for some period of time of all the folks that had come to their home uh, and uh, uh, as well as phone records and those type of things. Uh, I can only assume that some of the paperwork that's in there are, are transcripts of the conversations that Jason had uh, as well as Yagi uh, during the interrogation which lasted for a very long time. your knowledge have any uh, religious figures uh, called for mercy for uh, Jason? Uh, we have done some, uh, some outreach uh, to uh, religious figures. There have been interfaith groups that have uh, specifically told us that they have sent uh, letters uh, to the Supreme Leader uh, on Jason's behalf or, uh, and others who we spoke to and uh, wouldn't ask, uh, would respect the privacy of their communications, and so um, I, I really can't talk about that. Is there anything on that one? Hi, this question's a little off track, um, but I'm the journalism teacher from Jason's high school, and I remember that he called to tell me when he got this job. He was so excited about it. He loves Iran, he wants people in America to understand the beauty of the culture, and he was really excited to be able to have this opportunity. And I wanted to know if you could just share um, maybe one of the stories that he wrote about that he was particularly excited about and that he had fun doing. I know I read a lot of them and had so much fun seeing how he was able to bring the richness of the culture to us, but I would love to know if there was something that personally you knew he was having fun doing. Jason, is, as you may remember, is an Oakland A's fan. He's a big baseball fan. Uh, and Jason was really tickled to discover that um, people were actually beginning to play baseball in, in, in Iran, and he wanted to do a story about it. Uh, and um, he went out and I think uh, was both struck by the enthusiasm that they brought to the, uh, to the endeavor and um, uh, a bit taken aback by the uh, ineptitude they brought to the endeavor. Uh, and so Jason told a story about uh, a team that probably resembled the Bad News Bears, uh, probably had, um, had some trouble keeping track of enough baseballs to, uh, to keep the game going. Foul balls were really a big tragedy. Um, but he told a story um, uh, about young people and sports and about a country that was um, embracing this kind of fun um, without regard to kind of cultural barriers. And he had a lot of fun uh, writing it. We had a lot of fun publishing it. And um, we were just as tickled to hire him as he was to join the post. Can you 
Do, do you think uh, Jason's dual citizenship is, is, is a problem in this case? And um, do the Iranians recognize his American citizenship? Uh, so I think that's a very good question. Uh, you know, so his dual citizenship, I think, does contribute here. Uh, and I think it proves out uh, by the facts of some other cases. Uh, both Jason and I are considered uh, Iranian citizens by their government because my father was born, our father was born in Iran. Uh, despite the fact that we were born in, and raised in, in California, uh, and Jason never went to Iran before he was 25, 26 years old. Uh, the fact that we are Iranian citizens uh, as well as American citizens uh, essentially gives the Iranian government the excuse to say that the U.S. government should not be involved in the issue and has no, no, not only no say in the matter, but should not be involved at all. So in cases that involve American citizens or, other, uh, or citizens of other, other countries that don't have diplomatic relations with Iran in the same situation as us, their protecting power would be able to get involved. So in our case, it's the Swiss. Because Jason is a dual national, the Swiss have been denied access to Jason, whereas in the past, other American citizens who have ha had legal issues in Iran of, of various varieties, other uh, citizens from other countries have access either to their protecting power or uh, to their own uh, embassy uh, for consular access. So uh, at this point, uh, nearly eight months into it, Jason, and, and with constant requests for consular access via our protecting power of the Swiss, we have yet to be able to have, Jason has yet to have any access uh, to them. All right, anybody else? Okay, well, Please. I think we have some thoughts that we're kicking around and haven't quite decided what we're going to do. I think that um, one of the things that we wanted to do was to be able to know that the, the message was getting out more broadly, that really this is a time that's critical, not just because of Nowruz, not just because of his birthday, but because of the fact that this time of year is, is making it just so much worse for him psychologically in Iran. I think that we would like to use it as a time uh, to raise awareness. And uh, you know, consistent with that, I think we'll, we'll uh, determine what, the best, what our best things to do are on Sunday. All right, anybody else? Thank you so much for coming today and we keep Jason forefront in our minds. We're going to get him out. Stay on it. Do your part. And eventually, we want to come back here and celebrate, OK? Thank you so much. Oh, uh, one thing I uh, forgot to mention is the second video that I, I mentioned uh, with my mother uh, is going to be played here. Uh, I think a, a short loop of it, maybe five minutes if you'd like to. I have to step out for just a moment and then I'll be back if anybody wants to talk to me offline. But uh, you'll have the opportunity to see the video uh, where my mom's talking about her trip to Iran.